idea. Man, I feel hurt and... Let's stand.
Father, we're so grateful that we are able to gather here in your house this morning. Lord, we ask that your presence would walk through this place, that you would touch the lives of those who are seeking you, that you would work, that you would be recognized as Savior. And Lord, for those especially who are mourning here this morning as well, Lord, that you would have your gentle touch that would just bring about a peace that goes and surpasses all understanding. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to each and every one of you here this morning. I have to say, it's been a little while since we've heard Lydia with her cello. We could get um, Emily up here with a fiddle and Charlotte perhaps on the piano sometime as well. That would be really cool. But how many of you remember the full orchestra. Esther was pretty hard, fast out of her hand at the full orchestra that was up here. Well, I got a little taste of it over here just this morning. Um, so I'm going to invite for the next song, everybody sit right here next to Lydia. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's absolutely great that you're here this morning. Um, also, a special welcome to, I know Denise's parents are here as well. They've traveled all the way from Forest just to be here this morning. Um, and a few other faces that I have not seen before. So, a very special welcome to you as well. For those of you who missed out and weren't here on Friday evening, you missed out on a wonderful evening of fun. Um, the funny thing of it is, uh, a lot of planning went into uh, the whole evening by June, as well as many others. Um, but you wouldn't have had the opportunity to see what Steve was working with down here when he was doing his music. So I did snap a picture of Steve while he was here for practice just before. He said he was having a little bit of trouble that night. I don't know why. Um, but it was an absolute uh, amazing evening of fun and laughter and some great music and uh, some questionable talent. <laughs> but it was a great time. So looking forward to next year's talent night already, June. Um, also, next Sunday, there will be no Sunday school, the week of Easter Sunday. Um, so there will be special refreshments at 10.15, and they'll have, uh, we'll have our Easter celebration service at the usual time of 10.45. So remember, no Sunday school next Sunday. As well as uh, tonight, the Palm Sunday ecumenical service is being held at the Mount Salem Community Church. All the details are there in the bulletin. Um, as well as there is, I believe, a sign-up sheet out in the foyer for the EMCC regional gathering. So if that's something that you would like to be part of, um, there's information about it, as well as a sign-up sheet. Make sure that you take the opportunity to, uh, to sign up for that. Um, and then, last announcement, I'll call Esther up, is there is a Good Friday service here on Friday morning. Uh, normal time for church, 1045, so we'll have our, community, or our Good Friday service on, uh, the, at the same time at 1045. Yeah, don't, don't sit down. <laughs> I told you I was going to do that. Good morning. <laughs> He said we could come up and sit right there, did he not? <laughs> False advertising, that's what that is. <laughs> um, last week we had our uh, first, yes, our first meeting to start to get together for our um, 125th anniversary. And uh, we got through a few things, but some of you were missing. And we really, really would like to have your input. So, um, Anne is going to send out an email blast with a little form for you to fill out. And if you don't get email, then um, there are some hard copies for you. But on that form, there's an uh, opportunity there for you to say anything that you've thought of that you've seen done before at other churches and really liked, or that you wish other churches would have done or we would have done differently other times and you want to add that in there. If you know some friends that used to go to uh, worship with us but have moved away, um, then reach out to them, and I'd rather they had a verbal from you and a formal invitation than would they get missed. So um, let's give it our best shot. If you think of us as a family, and I know we do, um, we just want to make sure that when we're having a big gathering, for a, such a big celebration that everyone is here and enjoying 
and uh, that it builds further history for, you know, the next milestone, uh, 225 years. <laughs> they're they're going to need your memories written down, I think, by then. Um, but yeah, so, and the next meeting, uh, actual meeting, will be April the 4th and uh, 7 o'clock here at the church. And that meeting will be one more time to uh, kick at the can and say, how do we want that to look like? What do we want to do to promote it? And is there anything we can do to promote it that would also kick off some of the, the community ministries that we want to reach out to and start or enhance that's already being done by someone else or ourselves? Um, so yeah, there's lots of room there for growth and excitement and celebration. So put your thinking caps on and uh, pray about it, big time pray about it, um, to see, make sure that uh, all we do and say brings glory to God. It's not about us. We're going to have fun, but it's not about us. It's about God and bringing glory to him. Okay? Okay. Give it here. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. When it's kind of funny, this is part of family. When you get to know one another, and you've, you know, especially a number of you I've known for a number of years, um, to the point to where it's just, the, it's not just knitting, getting to know somebody, and it's not just family; it's friendship as well. And I love that we can have that kind of relationship here. If you're new here, it'll build as well. Yeah. If it's if it's something that you're not familiar with. Don't worry, it'll happen. And you may not want it to, but it just suddenly does. You're going to become part of the family and as well as friendship. So, um, As every year on Palm Sunday, we have a very special time as we sing Hosanna that the kids, and if you feel like a kid, and I don't care if you're Dave Helson's age, uh, you can absolutely... See, he didn't even hear me. <laughs> Uh, absolutely come on up because uh, Miss Kathleen is going to have um, the branches. I believe they're already up here. And she's going to lead everyone. So all you kids and kids aged and feel like kids, come on up to the front and grab a palm branch. And as we sing, I want to ask everybody to stay seated so that we can enjoy the kids as they celebrate uh, with us.
And if you kids want to keep those palm branches, you can. Just don't, you know, bother and pester your parents with them.
The earth is the Lord and everything in it and all who live in it. This morning we had a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of prayer items that have come up. Uh, we've been praying for Dustin. I was informed this morning that he's off support in talking like in, in sharing. So that's a huge prayer, answer to prayer. Um, Al, who is out west and in hospital, we found out that he's progressing. He still has a long way to go, but we're still praying for him, right? We're still praying. Because we remember that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. David writes in Psalm 24, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. A sister of ours, Audrey Hill, has ascended that hill as of yesterday evening and is with the Lord. And so we pray for her family. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your hands, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, so you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory, our eternal rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the king of glory, that our hope resides in you, our Father God. That though the bones, these bodies, they come apart, they fall in pieces, Lord, in one day we all rest in dust. Lord, our souls go to be with you. That an eternity rests for us with the loving and wondrous God, creator of all things. And so we thank you for the example of Audrey and the blessing that she was to this congregation. And we praise you and bring glory to you that you have brought her home. We continue to pray for Dustin as he recovers, for Al as he progresses, for those, Lord, in our congregation and in our midst that are struggling, both physically, emotionally. Lord, those that are ailing and those that are hurt. Lord, that you would bring healing, that you would bring restoration. Lord, that you would bring souls to you. Father, as a church, we come before you and we plead. Lord, that we would be counted in those that have clean hands and pure hearts because, Lord, you have washed them clean by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, we come to you through him, your son, pleading with you that you would rest with us, that you would walk with us, that you would hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you for your love, for the grace and the mercy that comes through your son, Jesus Christ, for the work you have done on our behalf, for Father, because, Lord, we can't do it on our own. We rest in you. As a people, we pray that you would do these things, that you would work on our behalf. Lord, because it is you who we lift our voices up to. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, the King of glory, the eternal, the ever-present, our Father in heaven. 
Amen. And at this time, we're going to take up our offering. As is my custom to forget, <laughs> we will pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts that you give to us. And Lord, in this time, we take great joy in giving back to you in doing the work of the church in our community and around the world, we pray that you would, that you would multiply these gifts for your glory. Amen. I'm going to ask that you all just remain seated.
Good. There we go. More volume. It's what everybody's asking for. At least it's not more cowbell. The reality is, is most of us would tell, most of us would say, you know, I don't strut in, but I'm also not a wallflower. I kind of meander in. The first thing I want to do is I want to check out the rest of the room. I'm going to find out who else is going. I want to dress the way everybody dresses. I want to walk how everybody walks. So if everybody's strutting in, I'm going to, li- I'm going to give a little bit of a strut. Like when you go and preach for the first time, you say, you know what? I'm going to wear a jacket and slacks. And I'm going to put a tie in my back pocket just in case. And when you walk into a room and everybody's in blue jeans and a t-shirt, you know, the the tie falls out the back pocket, the jacket gets thrown off, and you might probably leave the suspenders on because you forgot your belt. (laughs) You, you, You check out the room. You see how the room looks. The reality is, is in the passage we're going to look at this morning as we continue to walk through Mark, shows us how Jesus enters, like how he makes his mark, how he is making an entrance. And we're going to dive into Mark chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, jump to Mark chapter 11. Mark is the book that comes right after Matthew, and chapter 11 comes right after chapter 10. I joke, but the reality is, is our, our, our Bibles are broken down into books, and, our, and the books are broken down into chapters, and our chapters are broken down into verses. And if you've never seen a Bible before in your life, it is so confusing. So if you don't know exactly where you are, don't feel like you, you're embarrassed because we've all been there, and we had to learn all of these things as we went. So chapter 11, starting in verse 1, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are doing this, tell him the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. So they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, like, what are you doing untying that colt? His disciples answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead of them, those who followed, shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. 
I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And John's baptism, was it from heaven? Or from men, tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask then, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority. I am doing these things. Let's pray. Father, we open your word. Father, we come face to face with you as you walk the roads of Jerusalem, of Bethany, as you journey with your disciples. Jesus, we pray. And in this time, you would speak to us that you would guide us through your word, that we would know you better, that in our time this morning you would be praised and adored as our hearts unfold before your word, as we worship you in this way. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As we look at this really big passage, normally you just take the chunk and, and as soon as they're done singing Hosanna, you kind of end things off on Palm Sunday. So today we're actually going to take the whole swath of chapter 11 and we're going to look at how Jesus enters and makes his mark. And we see how he enters in three different ways and we're going to go through those three different ways this morning. All with this understanding, this one understanding as we walk through, is that he went first. He went first. We need to recognize, be, and live in him. If there's anything that you take away this morning, if you write this down, if you fall asleep, that's okay. They have my mic. They can turn me up. <laughs> All right? But he went first. We need to recognize him. We need to be in him, and we need to live in him. That's the big thing I want you to take away this morning as he makes an entrance. Now, as we walk through this passage, we see this kind of, this, this movement. It kind of goes A, B, C, B, A. And if I had been forward thinking, I might have put this on the screen for you so that you could map out what's in my brain. It's a scary place. and We need a map if you're going to go in there. But as you kind of walk through the passage, you're going to see Jesus beginning at the, at the very beginning. He enters into Jerusalem on a, on a colt. He enters into Jerusalem with authority. That's the first thing he does. He enters into, into Jerusalem with authority. You don't ride on a colt that's been unridden for no apparent reason. You don't get on the back of a little colt for no reason and ride into Jerusalem. There's only one reason you do that. You do that because you're a conquering king. You're an emperor. You're, 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 you've, been, you've, been, you've been through a conquest and you've won. You've been victorious. That's why Hosanna, Hosanna comes to mind. That's why they sing these things. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the, of the Lord. Like, why do they sing this? Why do they focus on him as king? It's because he's riding on a colt. He's making a point. He's making an entrance. Like, he could have just kind of wandered in, meandering in, but 
this is as good as you can get strutting into Jerusalem. There's no better way for a king to enter into a city than on the back of an unridden colt. He's making a point. I'm king. He's making a point. I am the one you are looking for. And I have conquered. And he's making this statement of conquest, of authority, before he actually does the deed. Right? He hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't risen from the grave. This is faith. This is prominence. This is God saying, I am he. I am. As he walks in, as he rides in, in conquest, he is saying, I am. He hasn't defeated anything else. He hasn't conquered anything else. He's not the king of anything else. And yet he is the king of all things. We read Psalm 24. He is the king. He is the glory. He is the authority. And he enters into Jerusalem in authority. What's funny is, is you go to the very end of the passage and what's the first thing that they're questioning? Do they question the donkey? Do they question his teachings? They question his authority. You get this, this, this schism. You begin with authority and we're going to end the chapter questioning his authority. Everybody on the streets throwing their jackets, they're throwing their palm branches, they're, pr- they're throwing whatever it is that they can before the king in recognition of his conquest that is to come. They don't understand that yet, but they will soon enough. And then just the next day, they're like, no authority. How do you do what you're doing? They question his authority. How do, you, how do you make all of these things happen? How do miracles actually happen? How, how are you doing what you're doing? And what authority do you have to teach this way and to speak to us this way and to do the things that you're doing in this way? Where is your authority? Jesus in his wisdom does the, does the thing he does all the time. You ask me a question, I ask you a question. With a little caveat, I'll answer yours if you answer mine. He's a tricksy one. Brilliant, though. Just, a, just, just in, in, in rabbinic fashion, that's just the way that rabbis worked. Is you ask me a question, I ask you a question. But if you're not willing to answer, I'm not willing to answer either. He comes in authority. He enters with authority. And can you take that authority away from him? No. See, they can question all they want, but his authority isn't relinquished. His power isn't withheld. His authority stays. He stands. There's no questioning the authority of Jesus Christ. It's there. It's evident. You can challenge it, yes, But just because you challenge it doesn't mean that his authority is relinquished or that it's not there anymore. How how often do we do that? We push our agenda or we push our authority. We we strive to to kind of push back the will and the agenda of God and say, no, I want my agenda. I want what I want. It's funny because they they were happy to throw palm branches and their cloaks down as he entered Jerusalem. But after he does everything that he does in Jerusalem, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, the first thing, they're quite happy to say, no authority. How do you do what you do? Let me push back on the authority that you say you have. Because my agenda is more important. How often do we do that? Seeking to hold on to authority in us. Seeking to to hold on to, to, to maintain the autonomy we think that we actually have. Do we give way to the will that God has for us in this life? Do we kneel to the authority that Jesus enters in? 
You see, he enters with authority. He enters with authority because he went first. He went first. And our response to him going first and entering with authority is to recognize. Will we recognize his authority? Because this coming week, Holy Week, all about the work that God has done through this, His Son, Jesus Christ, is all about recognizing the authority. Will you recognize His authority? The second way He enters. He enters with purpose. He enters with purpose We see this in his entrance into the story of the fig tree. Always kind of scratched my head to this story. There's a couple of stories in the New Testament I scratch my head on. I'm like, why would you curse a fig tree that wasn't in season? That's just not fair. That's just not fair. But the reality is, is he came up to this tree that was in leaf. Apologies. He comes up to this tree that's in leaf. And there's nothing there. Now, at this, time of this, at this time of the season, there's something there. It's supposed to be growing. It might not be completely ripe, but he's hungry. Have you ever re- eaten an unripened banana? I have. I've done it because I was hungry. In fact, I think we've all eaten something that's been unripe. Because we're hungry. And Jesus is walking along. He's hungry. And so he sees a fig tree way off. And he goes to that fig tree. And he's looking for something. Maybe something to nibble on. And he finds absolutely nothing. That's the first reality that we see in this fig tree moment. The second thing is he's making a point. He comes to a fig tree. And it's not in season. And there shouldn't be anything on the, on the branches that's ripe for him to eat. What does Peter tell us? In season and out of season, be prepared. And so he comes to Jerusalem, and he comes to the people of God, and he should find fruit. Whether it's their season or not, he should find fruit, and he doesn't. Remember, he's just been in Jerusalem, and he kind of took a look around the temple. Did he say anything? No. No. He didn't say anything. If you look in the passage there, he didn't say anything. He kind of left because it was late, right? And he comes back, and on his way back, he meets this fig tree. He's already a little tarnished and a little frustrated because he's seen what's in the temple, and he knows what he's going to have to do now. He needs to deal with the reality of an unripened, unproducing, unfruitful generation. An unfruitful people. He says, you will not again bear fruit. You're done. I am done with this tree. And then a few verses later, he's going to come back to that tree. And he's going to show purpose in what he did. Because he's going to show his disciples and he's going to speak to Peter. And he's going to say, no, actually, yes, the tree is withered. From the root up, as is this people. But I have a purpose here, and my purpose is to build in you faith that can move mountains. My purpose here is to show you that you can come to the Father in heaven, pray to Him, come to Him. My purpose is to bring you into relationship with Him. Come to the Father. I love, how, I love how, how Jesus says this, though. He talks about coming to the Father and asking for anything in his name. And it will be given to you. And in the same passage, he says, but. If you and your brothers aren't getting along, you need to forgive sins so that your sins will be forgiven. You see, there's an, added, there's an added piece. It's not just vertical, it's horizontal. Don't get sick of that analogy because you're going to hear it for the next 30 years. 
See, it's all good and all well. We can, we can talk to God and we can deal with the thing. I can, I can ask him for anything I want. I heard, I've heard in my family, well, Dad, why can't we ask for a Ferrari? <laughs> well, first of all, son, I can't afford the insurance or the gas for a Ferrari. Second of all, that's not in the will of the Father. And I have to be in right relationship with him to ask for anything that I want. And I have to be in right relationship with my brothers and sisters to ask for whatever I want. And the reality is, is when our relationships with one another are, are working well and we are in harmony and unity, and when our relationship with the Father is in harmony and unity, what we ask for is very different from what you and I might ask for in our in our weaker moments. Like when we're hungry, we would, we would pray for a pizza to be delivered at the front door. But when we're hungry for the salvation of our neighbor, our stomach doesn't matter, but their souls do. And our prayers change when we are in right relationship and focused on the purpose that Jesus enters this world into. And four, because he enters with a purpose, and that is to make relationship right between you and the Father, and between you and your brothers and sisters, and between your brothers and sisters and the Lord. You see, he enters with a purpose. He enters with a purpose. Jesus doesn't do anything without first being in purpose. See, he went first. We need to recognize his authority. We need to be in his will. We need to be in his purpose. We need to be. Remember, if you're not going to be, stop doing until you are being in him and in relationship with him. Be. B. Here's the third thing that he, the, how, how he enters. He enters in holiness. See, if, if, you, if you branch it off, you have, you have A and A2. You got B and B2. You got how he enters into authority and how he exits in authority, in a sense, with, with the question of his authority. Then B is, is his journey to the fig tree. And then after after he enters into the temple, he goes out and they see that fig tree the next day. That's the, the second entrance of his purpose. But this one piece stands alone. This one piece stands alone, and that's his entrance into the temple. See, when we look at Mark 11, our first priority and our main priority is to look at his entrance into Jerusalem. But that's not what this passage is actually about. The whole chapter is actually directed to his entrance into the temple as he enters in holiness. It's one thing to enter, into, and enter in authority. It's a whole other reality to enter in holiness. See, if we didn't have a Jesus that was perfect, it wouldn't matter how he entered at all. But you see, he can enter into the temple and he can say, away with you to those people that are peddling their wares, that are, that are changing money and making an exorbitant amount of profit, who are selling lambs and pigeons for an insane price after somebody outside the temple has told them, oh, the lamb that you've brought, the pigeons that you've brought, they're just a little bit blemished. I can imagine in my mind what's going on because you, you get to know people and you get to know schemes really well. There's a guy sitting out in the, out in the, out, out in the outskirts of the temple and he's, he's seeing these, these people come in with their lambs and their pigeons and he's like, you know what? That lamb has got a little bit of a blemish there. They're going to take you out. They're going to send you out. You've been in line for four hours and they're just going to send you out to get a new lamb. You might as well just buy a, a new lamb inside. They've got them inside. They're unblemished. They're perfect for sacrifice. You know what? I'll give you five bucks for this one so you don't have to drag it in there. 
And then they grab the lamb and they, they, they hand it to their buddy and their buddy goes around to the back and he paints a little white on the, on the little blemish he thought he saw and he runs it into the temple and he sells it to the next guy for 20. And over and over and over it goes. And if you come and you don't have the temple coin, you have another version of, of cash on you, you know what? That's probably not going to work in the temple. So I'll give you one dollar for every five dollars you give me. And by the time you leave, it's like you've been at Walt Disney World. Like you've got nothing left. I don't know how I'm going to get home. And Jesus is sick of it. He saw it the night before and he's like, get out of my house. My house is not here for you to make money, to, to ridicule and hurt one another, to break one another and hurt one another. My purpose here, remember, is to bring you into relationship with God. And this place is supposed to be the place that you meet him in. And you've made it something else. And what he does here is he says, no. This place is a place of prayer. It's a place of coming before the Father in heaven to bring your sacrifices, to bring your atonement. And he brings salvation to that temple. And he makes right what was wrong. And he sets the stage for being the perfect sacrifice. And no one else, no one else could empty a temple like that. Let he who cast, let he who does not sin cast the first stone. Well, Jesus could cast the first stone. And Jesus could cast them out. Because in that moment, and in every moment before and every moment after, Jesus is perfect and has no sin. Which makes him the perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement for your sin and for mine. And right there in that temple, right there in that place, as he teaches, as he draws the people to the Father. This is what I want. I want you to connect with the Father in heaven. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Was it a place for all nations? No, it was only there for the Jews. But this temple, this newly built temple, what will come will be for all nations. Thank the Lord because I'm not Jewish. Ancestry.com says I'm as far away from Jewish as could possibly be. But I can come to the Father in heaven, the creator of all things, and I can be made right and pure, and I can stand before him clean because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross that he exemplifies here, and he says, everyone is welcome before me. What are we doing to make it possible for people to meet with the God who created them? What are we willing to overturn in our lives to demonstrate the expectations that he has for us in this way? See, Jesus makes an entrance he makes an entrance. He went first. And it's our responsibility to respond with recognition. Recognize his authority. That's what you and I are called to do. Yes, he is king. He is king over everything. The world and all that is in it the universe that he created, the cosmos that continue to be made visible to us. Creation. 
made before our very eyes. Recognize his kingship, his authority. He entered first. He entered first. At the very dawn of time, he created. Our places to recognize. To see that he enters in purpose for us to be. And when we are doing and not being, it's as if we skipped a step and we're not recognizing. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He restores our souls. Not you and I working ourselves out. He does that for us. Are we being? And it's a whole lot easier to be when we recognize the king of the universe desires relationship with us. You see, he comes in holiness. He enters in holiness. And because of that, we can live in him. Because he makes all things new. And he makes all things beautiful in his time and in his space and for an eternity with him. Will you recognize? Will you be and will you live in him because he's done it all first? And he calls you and I to follow after him to be a part of the procession, hailing the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Aurora wants to join too. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sound of children and the joy of the coo of babies. And we thank you, Father, that you call us to be children. Because it's only when we are like children that we can recognize the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, we are blemished people and we are hurt people. We are broken people and we we need to see, Lord, that you have come first. That we follow in your footsteps. Help us to recognize that we might be and live in you as you enter our lives in authority, you enter our lives in purpose, and you make us holy because you enter in holiness. May you be glorified through our lives today and as we enter into Holy Week, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the great and awesome sacrifice that you make That we can enter a week like this week knowing how it ends. And that the end is only the beginning for for us. Because of your great and profound love for us. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Tim, when you mentioned that uh, because he went first, the first thing I thought was we are able to love because he first loved us. Let's stand.
able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.